Bula and welcome to the MOOC on Pacific Studies offered by the University of the South Pacific. My name is Frances and I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Education here at USP. I'm also the Associate Dean for Research and International at the Faculty of Arts, Law and Education. I will be your facilitator in this lecture. We hope that you enjoy your learning journey. This lecture on Pacific research methodologies is designed around three key learning outcomes. By the end of this module, you will be able to appraise the usefulness of indigenous approaches to research. You will also understand how complex research in Pacific Island communities actually is, and you will have a better understanding of the theoretical and methodological assumptions and implications in Pacific research. At the heart of the indigenous worldview, or the way that indigenous people see the world and their place in it, we find a common thread, that is, of relational spaces. The indigenous worldview is governed by three basic principles. One, a deep spiritual sense of culture and place. Two, connectedness within community, environment, and the wider cosmos. And three, that these culminate in a collective and an individual belief that maintaining and nurturing relationships is critical to maintaining a sense of balance and harmony towards cultural continuity and survival. Take an example from the Samoan and Tongan cultural knowledge system. Let us consider the concept of the va or sacred spaces between. In the Samoan and Tongan context, Relationships are governed by indigenous beliefs. A sacred space is called the Va Tapuia in Samoan and Ve Tapui in Tongan, which translates into sacred relational spaces. The relational spaces or sacred relationships that we are talking about begins with a spiritual self, the gods, the ancestors, the wider community, and the natural environment. And these relationships are played out through the lived experience and daily engagement or practices which are underpinned by a wide range of values. A few of these values are presented here to demonstrate this. Love and compassion, respect, responsibility, reciprocity, unity, service, status, and duty. This example is provided as an important insight or indigenous standpoint to the broader conversation about research, or more specifically, research within Pacific indigenous communities. So what does it mean to rethink research? Research, like formal education or schooling, is an imposed system of doing comprised of imported structures and processes which bring with them specific philosophies and ways of learning and knowing. These originate in the global north, so they are western systems, and they bring with them a set of approaches, each with their own assumptions about the world and human engagement within that world. The beliefs, attitudes and behaviours shaped by western research, or mainstream research, theories and approaches, are conceptualised and developed in the global north, or the west. They are imbued with a particular set of values which are too often taken on blindly and unknowingly by all researchers. They reinforce a particular kind of understanding and definitions of space, time, gender, objectivity, subjectivity, knowledge and researcher privilege and power. In contrast, when we talk about a Pacific research agenda or approach, we are talking about Pacific ways of doing research. As Manulani Meyer said it, we simply see, hear, feel, taste, and smell the world differently. So we are promoting a decolonization of research approaches. When we talk about an indigenous approach to research, we are talking about transforming the research practice, the way we think about and do research. And the ultimate expectation is that, through practice, we might begin to engage in informed, committed, 
reflective decision-making, or as Aristotle termed it, praxis. Through continuous practice, we are able to learn about what works best in specific situations or contexts. In this dated but important piece of writing, we learn about different levels of racism that play out in society and in higher education. The authors argue that when we push one way of thinking about knowledge and research, we are guilty of a kind of racism that they refer to as civilizational or epistemological racism. This means that we are privileging one kind of knowledge about other kinds, and we are saying that anything that is not in line with this particular way of thinking is not as good. That is, a kind of racism. So how do we combat racism? We use awareness, advocacy, re-education, and intervention. And it is from this entry point that our discussion really begins. The idea behind the development and use of Pacific research methodologies is to negotiate a space or spaces within the global knowledge base to allow for alternative ways of doing, thinking, and being. And in Pacific research methodologies, we are asking key questions about how Pacific people think and act. Dr. David Gegeo, who will be facilitating a number of sessions in this MOOC, has an important point for us to consider. He says Pacific Island scholars and researchers need to develop research strategies that are grounded in their own specific ways of thinking, being, and doing. He explains that many non-Pacific Islanders struggle with the idea that Pacific people have philosophies because they think that it is tied to written language. This idea is incorrect. It is incorrect because philosophy predates literacy or our ability to read and write. Every cultural community, every civilization, whether it was a literate or an oral society, had and has its own set of philosophies. Professor Linda Tohiwai Smith is a particularly important scholar in the conversation about Pacific research approaches and methodologies. She is best known for her seminal work titled Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous Peoples. Professor Smith explains that research is tied to European imperialism and colonialism. She says that research is a dirty word in the indigenous vocabulary because of the way that these communities have been exploited by researchers in the past. She argues that Western researchers and intellectuals make some incorrect assumptions about indigenous communities that they don't really understand or know. Smith's main argument is that indigenous people see the world differently and engage in ways that correlate to their world views. She says that research is transformed when we allow indigenous ways of thinking to inform our research practice. Day 2012 has two important reminders. First, he says that indigenous peoples need to understand the importance of anti-oppressive or empowering theories and practices in research because it is only then that we are able to transform not just research but our own communities as well. Second, he makes the point that a community is a shared space, shared thought, and shared body. He argues that the power of the community as a unit is more powerful than a large group of individuals who have their own personal perspectives and worldviews. Research is about looking for or searching for knowledge. When we engage in research, we set ourselves a set of questions, and we look for the answers to these questions. If we are interested in conducting research in Pacific communities, we need to understand how knowledge is created, produced, negotiated, shared, and transmitted within the community that we are researching. In Pacific communities, the communal self or group worldview 
is privileged over the individual self. And within this system, knowledge is categorized into three main groups, open knowledge, closed knowledge, and negotiated knowledge. Open knowledge refers to knowledge that is known to everyone, such as sitting arrangement in the community house, and language which is shared by all. Closed knowledge refers to the knowledge that is held within a clan or family, such as navigational skills, herbal medicines, etc. Within these closed clan or family knowledge systems, it is further categorized and closed along gender lines, for example, where navigation skills in particular boat building and sailing are passed down along male lines only. Similarly, herbal medicines for men would be passed down through male family members. And in the case of women's herbal medicine, it is passed down through female lines. It is important to note that even though knowledge may be open within a community, it may be closed to outsiders or non-members of the group. When we talk about negotiated knowledge, we are referring to an allocated space where someone who doesn't belong to a particular closed group might be able to come into that group and ask permission for access to certain levels of knowledge. This may require a traditional ceremony requesting access and information. The closed community then has the right to say yes or no. And even if they do agree and give permission, they may decide to only share a very small part of the knowledge rather than all of it. When we talk about research as seeking knowledge, we see new rules of engagement emerge. And the researcher now has to learn to abide by the expectations of the community. This shifts power from the researcher to the community and situates the researcher as a learner. In the indigenous Fijian context, any newcomer or visitor to a village will need to present a sevu sevu or traditional cover ceremony seeking entry into that communal space and asking for permission to enter or to conduct research. In Samoa and Tonga, there is also an expectation of sharing genealogies. If the researcher is able to share his or her genealogy, then the cultural community is able to negotiate a relationship with the researcher. So we see it comes back to relationships and respectful spaces. So what are we looking for when we talk about Pacific research approaches? Basically, we are genuinely interested in engaging in what we call a hermeneutic inquiry. The word hermeneutic simply means interpretive. So research is an interpretive inquiry that allows a researcher some deeper insight into this particular community. So we want to find out what is as opposed to what we think or assume might be. We want to respond to those research structures which do not consider our cultural contexts. We want to reclaim a place for Pacific indigenous knowledge systems within the global conversation. We want to reassert the ownership of indigenous knowledge so that it remains the intellectual property of indigenous peoples forever. We want to rethink concepts of accuracy, validity, reliability, and ethics. And we want to develop and use specific frameworks which will help us to do these things. Novice researchers, or those engaging in Pacific research for the first time, need to ask themselves a number of questions. As an experienced researcher, each time I go into a new cultural community, I also ask myself these kinds of questions. In order to prepare ourselves for research, we need to ask, how do people in the community that I have selected view the world, and what are their beliefs about knowledge, knowledge creation, knowledge ownership, and knowledge sharing. Who is a knower of the knowledge that I'm seeking, and how can I access this knowledge? And do I have the right to access this knowledge? How might I go about seeking permission to gain this knowledge? 
what are some of the ways that I might go about negotiating a position within this community so that I could access the information I need? Would my supervisor have all of this information or do I need to seek the advice of a cultural advisor? Are there local research methods I could use? Where would I find these? What can I do to develop competencies and skills required to enhance the research process? When we answer questions like these, we are better able to think about what we need to do to prepare to go into a particular research community. There are some skeptics who say that using an indigenous approach reduces the quality of a research project. This table shows four key issues that are at the heart of what makes a good or strong research project. They are validity, reliability, ethics, and the search for truth. The argument that we present here is simple. It is possible to work from these core ideas and build into a research project local ways of verifying accuracy, and credibility of research processes and approaches. Remembering that there are specific ways of doing things in each cultural community, we do not prescribe or set in stone ways of ensuring validity or reliability, for example. Rather, as you can see in this table, we provide the researchers with sets of questions that help them design and develop their own research methodology. When we talk about research methodology, we are referring to the research design and all of the methods and approaches that we are going to use. All of these come together in your methodology. The methodology is underpinned by some basic philosophical foundation. In this presentation, we are looking specifically at specific methodologies or specific ways of framing a research project. Methodology is not a synonym for methods. Your methods for data collection and data analysis form part of the methodology. So methodology is larger than methods. According to Bishop and Glynn, it is important to think about the cultural frames that we are using in a study. They explain that when we attempt to verify or prove the accuracy of something, whether it is written text or data collected from participants, the researcher must use cultural criteria to determine the accuracy and value of that information. From the 1990s, many research models and frameworks have emerged in New Zealand and in the Pacific Islands. These methodologies have been developed to do exactly what Bishop and Glynn are talking about to verify the text and data using cultural criteria. What we notice about these methodologies is that they are all designed around an understanding of how to negotiate relationships within specific cultural contexts. In this lecture, we focus on three select Pacific research frameworks. These are Fonofale, a Samoan model, Kakala, a Tongan model, and Vanua, a Fijian model. Fonofale is based on the metaphor of a Samoan house. Kakala is developed around the metaphor of garland making in Tonga, and Vanua refers to the relationship between people and the land, a metaphor for the entire cosmos or worldview. Fonofale, or meeting house, first emerged in the 1980s in community health work within Pacific communities in New Zealand. In 1995, it was established as a research framework. Fonofale reinforces a holistic worldview and cultural continuity, and it captures the values and beliefs about culture, spirituality, and community. As a research framework, it provides a philosophical base for the research design so that the researcher is better able to frame his or her study using signposts that are highlighted in the model. These signposts include time, context, environment, family relationships, 
and interwoven elements of the physical, spiritual, mental, and other identity markers of the family unit and the personal self. When we use a Pacific research framework, the researcher prioritizes the community of research and tries to ensure that all of the research choices that she or he makes regarding first entry into a community, making contact, collecting data, developing relationships, coding, analyzing and interpreting data, reporting findings, giving back to the community, and departing are all taken into consideration in the context of the framework. Research ethics are also considered important in this cultural perspective or standpoint. A supplementary reading has been provided that fleshes out the deeper multi-layered aspects of the Fono Fale model. <coughs> The Kakala framework was first developed by Professor Konai Helufeyman in her doctoral study, which looked at Tongan teachers' philosophies of teaching and education in Tonga. It is based on the metaphor of the garland making process. Later, the Kakala framework was further developed as a research framework, and it has also been used as an evaluation framework for use in the Tongan context. A Kakala framework may be described as a process model. It began as a simple three-stepped process involving Toli, Tui, and Luva. The first stage involved the collection of flowers and the kinds of decisions made in this process. The second stage is where the flowers are further selected and strung together in a garland. And the final stage was the garlanding or act of presenting the garland to the intended recipient. Today, the current Kakala framework, which has been further enhanced and developed by the work of other Tongan scholars and researchers, has six stages. As a deeply reflective research model, the six stages include conceptualization of the study, data collection, analysis, reporting and outcomes, relevancy and usefulness, and finally, application, transferability, and sustainability. The Kakala framework draws from Tongan cultural values, beliefs, and understandings about community and relationships, as well as knowledge creation and sharing. A supplementary reading has been provided on the Kakala framework. The third framework we will look at in this lecture is called the Vanua framework. It first emerged in 1980 and was further developed in 2002 and 2006 respectively. The word Vanua literally translates to mean land, but in the indigenous context it means so much more than just earth, soil or land. In the indigenous context, Vanua, or Fanua, Fenua, and Fonua in other Pacific languages, refers to the connection and relationships between humans and the wider known world or universe, the indigenous cosmos. Vanua captures a relationship between mother and child, land and the people, and we see the umbilical cord and placental connection of life forces between the mother and child. Vanua reinforces beliefs about the various realms, including the spiritual and physical realm, and it affirms an ideology that humans do not own land or Vanua, but rather they take on a short-term custodianship as stewards of the Vanua. In this way, a spiritual connection between people and their specific geographical and spiritual place is prioritized. As in Fonofale and Kakala, the Vanua framework also brings with it specific ways of engaging in context, 
developing relational spaces and maintaining them, and engaging in ethical research practice by practicing or living particularly important cultural values. A supplementary reading has been provided which allows you to find out a little bit more about the Vanua framework. The three examples show us the importance of relationship and values. On this slide, we see a selection of a range of values that indigenous researchers from these three cultural groups have identified as important to ethical research practice. You can see a clear parallel between the three cultural communities. Each cultural community advocates a particular cultural practice or way of life. Tongans refer to this as Fakatonga, Samoan say Fa'a Samoa, and Fijians say Bula Vakavanua or Vakaviti. Values such as love and compassion, respect, reciprocity, interpersonal relationships, restrained behavior or self-control, humility, service, spirituality, trust and gifting all come into play within the researcher and participant's relationship. Designing a Pacific research methodology or applying an existing methodology means getting to understand all of these values and how each one plays out in context. For example, it is considered disrespectful to stand or sit in an elevated position in relation to a chief, or dressing immodestly and speaking loudly, making eye contact, and sometimes the choice of words and gestures may be disrespectful or considered prideful in a cultural context. A researcher needs to be aware of these things in order to grow positive relationships within the research community so that he or she is able to find answers to the questions that they would like answered. If a researcher offends the research community, they may not participate, or worse still, they may pass on inaccurate information because of their dislike for the researcher. Are you familiar with Margaret Mead's study in Samoa? It may be interesting for you to take the time to think about why her work is considered controversial and inaccurate. To conclude our discussion on methodologies, we will look at just one method that is commonly used by researchers in the three cultural communities selected, the Talanoa method. Tala means to talk, while Noa means the unknown. So Talanoa means to talk or engage in a conversation the end result of which is unknown. Some researchers argue that because Talanoa is fluid and casual, it should not be used in research. Others who have used it, however, say that Talanoa as a research method requires fine-tuning, and the researcher brings the conversation back on topic when it begins to go off on a tangent or in a different direction. Still others have described Talanoa as a research method similar to semi-structured or unstructured interviews or storying, not storytelling because we have other concepts or words for that. This narrative form of data collection is important in the Pacific context because Pacific peoples were and are primarily an oral culture. We know that writing was introduced to the Pacific Islands only through contact. It is interesting as a side note, Pacific peoples did have a form of documenting important stories and beliefs through the use of symbols, a form of graphic communication. We see these symbols in heritage arts such as carvings, pottery, tapa and tattooing for example. And the community could read these symbols and reaffirm their core beliefs and shared values. In using Talanoa as an appropriate research method, the researcher first needs to understand and design a holistic methodology or research framework. And this methodology or framework needs to capture the beliefs, life philosophies and values important to the community of research. 
In this way, engaging in appropriate conversations will come naturally, and participants will engage in meaningful ways with the researcher. So, in summary, indigenous research approaches emerged as an attempt to decolonize the research process. It has evolved into an established research paradigm which privileges indigenous ways of doing research. Indigenous researchers, particularly in New Zealand and in the Pacific Islands, have for the last 25 years engaged in theorizing and practicing Pacific research approaches. This has given rise to numerous research frameworks, models, methodologies, and methods. The indigenous research paradigm presents an approach which shifts power from the researcher as an individual to the relational spaces between the participants and the researcher who collaboratively engage in making meaning. The argument is simple. If we as researchers are interested in really understanding the community of research and in interpreting their truth accurately, then we need to understand how culture frames their worldview and their lived cultural practice. We need to recognize the importance of developing a strong set of cultural competencies. And we must be ready to begin to develop, nurture, and maintain meaningful relationships with our participants. The main idea behind Pacific research methodologies is to ensure that our research is accurate, credible, and represents the community of research in an honest and ethical way. You should now take the time to read through the supplementary resources that have been provided for this lecture.